so yeah, to, to, today you're you're running more more son more son. We we were joking because I had a problem pronouncing it. So A A W S O N, um, and um, so it's a it's a A N I lab uh, A I sorry A I lab uh, in Australia, and you guys have, are investing and uh, building uh, projects from the ground. Uh, the three um, that I know, uh, there might be others that that are less known right now, are Popgun, Replica, and Super Res. Um, we're going to start linking like below the, the blog, we're going to link to the PubGun demos and stuff that are public, but you could just maybe s summarize the three projects and what, what makes them uh, unique. So while I was, um, one of the things we worked on at Hunted all the time, which we never solved was, um, all the, at the very core of recommendation in music is this similarity metric. These two songs are similar. How similar are they? I can listen to them and I can tell you how similar they are if I've listened to them. But computers can't do that. The actual audio itself was a black box. The best we could do was attach labels to it, text labels. And social media or Pandora's approach of human labeling or what Spotify is doing kind of stuff where they, where they add metadata to it is a proxy for the, thing, the, the raw fact that we don't understand with a computer what that sounds like. And I was always fascinated why we can't work with raw audio. Like, why do I have to wait for the crowd to tell me these two things are similar? Um, and so uh, we tried heaps of different things at Hunted in 2011, 2012. Looking back, it was foolish because the tech didn't exist to do it, but we didn't know that. We basically just ran up against walls continually. But then, you know, in around 2013 and 14 at Twitter, I was seeing the ML teams there start to do stuff with deep learning that I hadn't that I thought, oh, this is going to be a thing. They're going to be able to, if they can do this with image and handwriting recognition and imagery, surely someone's going to do this with audio. And then in around 2016, um, Google started to do a bunch of stuff out of their DeepMind team around speech synthesis and it was like, oh, they're going to solve this and it's going to be game on. We're going to be able to do true stuff like give me all the songs with a female vocalist, a harmonica and a bongo drum. Like, discovery like that. I don't know if anyone wants that, but I always fantasised about how cool that would be if I could <laughs> yeah. do that. Maybe with other you know. criteria, yeah, but for sure, of course. That's right. Or someone who sounds like Whitney Houston and, you know, with an acoustic guitar doing some something in 3-4 time or whatever, um, without any labelling, across massive catalogues. So truly perceiving based, based audio just like on, Yeah, just based on the audio. Solving the cold start problem that streaming services have. Like they can't, like right now, the state of the art on recommendations, something like Discovery Weekly, and they had came up with a really cool idea of that things belong together if a human says they belong together and the expression of that is putting them on a playlist and therefore their whole thing's driven by the intersection of playlists. And it's a perfectly, it's the best thing anyone ever came up with for we don't know what this is, how do we develop a proxy for it? And their engine is is genius at that. And I'm, we we prioritised a bunch of things ourselves around similar ideas, but they got to scale with it. So it worked across, you know, personalization and genres and because they had the scale of this playlist engine that did it really well. Um, but anyway, I'd seen this deep learning stuff and started to read up, and I'd been in machine learning myself for 10 years by then and felt like I had to get into this space, that this was going to completely change the... First of all, my only idea at the time was this will change how we do music discovery. This is going to be the new music discovery thing. And so for then the whole of 2016, I started Mawson with my with Graham, my original investor, and we wanted to do AI stuff, and we just couldn't recruit anybody. It was impossible. Anyone who knew what they were doing had already left the building, had gone to Google, had gone to America, whatever, back in Australia here. I just couldn't. Or they were working in self-driving cars and they were at universities doing PhDs and I just couldn't find – and I knew from my own experience that I can't just get web devs and teach them this. The math required to do this was beyond what I would do and what some most web devs or even normal software engineers would do. And it took me like nine months to meet someone, uh, a guy called Adam Hibble, who had a team of four or five guys and they were guns for hire doing deep learning projects around, around Brisbane at the time. And him and I kind of really hit it off and I – asked him to come and um, work in music, and he thought that was crazy. Like, who cares? Like, if you can do this tech, this is the least interesting thing you could do. But I knew because I knew people like Adam. He was 24 or 25 or something, 
And he reminded me a lot of myself at that age. I knew that if I could get him to work on it for a little while, he would get hooked on it like I did. And so I basically paid him and his team to build a music discovery site based on purely rural audio stuff. And they did it in like six weeks. And I was like this – and the way they'd done it, they had – they had this idea, which everybody had this idea in deep learning, was to understand something was to, you understand something by being able to generate it. That in the process of generating it, you create a recipe for it. And comparing recipes for two things tell you how similar they are. So to solve similarity in discovery, they had to generate raw audio. And then I realized, holy shit, if they're going to generate raw audio, discovery is the least exciting thing you can do with this. <laughs> we're going to do, we're going to write pop songs. Like we're going to change the music industry. And that's what Pop Gun set out to do. And then Bob Moz, it wasn't Pop Gun at that point. I was just working with Adam on, and we were having these aha moments of, oh, we're going to be able to compose songs here. We're going to actually be able to scan the top 40 chart and then create music that sounds like that. And then should we start a, and so initially we were called fake records and we were, we were going to have a, a record label, we were going to release music. And then Trump came along and took over the word fake, so we couldn't call ourselves that. And then Bob Moz, who I was a really good friends with at Twitter, we'd worked together there at the last death throes of my time at Twitter. He started Techstars Music and was trying to recruit teams, and he came. He suggested um, that Adam and I basically form Popgun and come to the program. And so we did that in December 2016. We went to the inaugural class in 2017, I brought Adam and I think four or five other young guys who were all mid-20s to come and do AI music composition stuff. Our pitch was we're going to have a top 40 hit. That was our goal and that is still the goal for the company. Um, it's now two and a bit years later. The company's now at um, 20-something people, depends on how many contractors are hanging around at any point, um, and they have been doing in stealth mostly um, they're trying to do serious music composition with AI, and um, so they were the first team that came through. What they are the, have, what are the, the so I know, I know there is two I think two videos, one from a couple of years back and one from last year that are public. Uh, is that the latest demo that you guys have released? No. So we've been so we got uh, we spent the first year in 2017 learning to play the piano. That's it. So how do we teach? A neural net to play. And the that piano. is the demo that and somebody starts playing, and then the computer finishes the the, the melody. No, that no, that was the first third of that year. Okay. So that was the demo of someone playing it, it completing it was with the demo we did for Techstars. So that was a prediction, polyphonic prediction. So can I play something on the piano, and then it will predict what I'm going to play next? We that was after we did that. We then worked on to. So that's a very like. First, very simple problem. How do I predict in a, in a sequence of things what would most likely come next? And after that, we did improvisation, which is given a piece of music, can we improvise on this and still make melodic sense? So can we explore all the other ways this could be played and capture still but still keep the musicality of this piece so it's recognisable to musicians that, yes, that's the same piece, but we're improvising with it. And then once we can do that, we're ready to actually do raw composition. So from and so at the end of 2017, after a year of 10 people working on that one problem for the whole year, we got to the point where we could compose original piano pieces. And we went to San Francisco. We basically said, check this out. Have you heard AIs make music before? They're like, yeah, yeah, it's always kind of crappy. Well, then check this out. <laughs> and they played amazing piano. And they were like, what did this and AI, you know, and by then it was, you know, if AIs can drive cars, surely they can play pianos. Like yeah. you'd expect it to be able to be. So, and people were blown away by what it could do on a piano. And we laid out a vision of we're going to teach you to play every instrument and then we're going to teach them to play together and then we're going to see what happens. Um, and then we're going to give it to everybody and see what people do with it. And we found we, we, we were lucky we met, we met some great investors on that, on that in that month we spent in San Francisco, but we ended up going with Coastal Ventures because they'd made so many bets in AI at the point. I think we were 28 or something like that, and they would they had really senior, well-respected AI guys in their team. We just thought they added a lot of value. The other firms were all specialists at different things. There was 
we met this we met Greylock and they had some awesome guys around who were out of Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter's growth teams and but that felt way too early for us because we didn't have anything to blow up and they seemed the perfect team to do that. But um, and we didn't we didn't have any idea at that point how hard this was going to be. We knew that it took us a year to play the piano. How long is this going to take? Like, and KV was super patient. Most of their investments had been around materials and medical stuff. And so they were like, yeah, this is hard tech. This is going to take a while. And we have to be patient around that type of thing. So um, in 2018, we started working. We did bass. We did drums. We did guitars. We started mixing. We started mastering. We started producing full pop songs. We started accompanying singers, and that was about the time. That was the end of our last demo, June 2018. And since then, we've been working on other stuff, which is if people are playing along at home, what the next inevitable thing a company who got to that point would do next. We haven't released what it is. It's really fucking hard, um, <laughs> but we think we're getting. We think we're getting there, but we're not. We are feeling somewhat in a rush, but we feel like. Um, Someone's going to do this and do it really properly and it, and with a really talented team. And you can kind of half-bake some of this stuff and rush it to the market and sound like elevator music and stuff like this. Someone's going to spend the time and the money and we're luckier. We, we're in Australia. We're on the other side of the world. We've got a great team who've been together from the start. We've got, um, we've got producers who work with us here in Australia that we're able just to put our head down and you have a very clear vision of it has to be it has to be as good as what an if if AI w- could do this what it would do like it has to be that good. It's, I guess you, can't you, just be- you, you mentioned self-driving cars and everybody expects a self-driving car to be a thousand times more efficient than a human because if a human crashes you're like well you know it's a human but if a robot crashes it's like the entire fleet of cars that that has a problem like the you know, the, the, like that's a serious like parenthesis, but the Boeing, there was two Boeing accidents and they removed every 737 in the world because there was something wrong with the machine. It was not a pilot mistake. <laughs> so I guess it's the same thing when you start to automate things and have AI do things for you. Uh, you need it to be a thousand X, a million X better than a human. You need it to be flawless. Everybody needs to have the same wow uh, and be in awe yes, in front of the right. tech. It can't be a half kind of... it. it, it, it a song that is half good is actually a bad song. There is no half good song. It's it's like meh, and you want you want everybody to go like wow in front of the song. Uh, that problem has to be extremely hard. Cars actually can like record uh, when you're driving your Tesla, for example. They're sending back all the driving information, and that's how they're building the self-driving cars. And so you're listening to like millions and millions and millions of songs, getting the patterns. Anybody that maybe is not tech can relate to the self-driving cars because that's more of a known subject. And uh, it's basically, I guess, the same thing at the beginning, except the end is one is a very rational driver and the other is a very creative song. And this is where the, 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 like the, the hardness, the toughness of the creative side comes at the end. Uh, getting all the information in might not be the hardest thing, but getting it to produce something creative that is new is actually the exact opposite than the self-driving car, which you want it to not do anything new and do exactly like what it's supposed to do. And you can predict mm. what it's supposed to do, where for you, you cannot really predict what it's supposed to, what the song is supposed to be. Um, the song mm. will surprise you when you listen to it. Um, yeah, I can't imagine how fascinating that project must be. So we're going to link to the first demo of Techstars, like the 2017. We're going to link to the 2018 one, um, and so I guess in a couple of months, in a few months before the end of the year, um, you guys are going to release like the, 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 the new demo that is this time, I guess, a lot more complete and has some of the things that you just explained, uh, different instruments, maybe more poppy. Um, that's that. Yeah, I'm extremely curious to see what you guys are going to come up with. Yeah, we feel like I feel um, I feel like everything that we did at Hunted led up to the opportunity to have people's trust and patience that that we're given the freedom to try and do it right. We know we kind of feel like it's easy too because there's many points, even though it's been two years and a long project to kind of stay and sell, there's just been enough points that many times you through it where you go, this is really cool, like that was really cool. And we have to keep going because we did, There's we haven't even really touched the surface yet, you know what I mean? 
And we see other people rushing AI and music things out and we know that this can't, this must just be heuristics or algorithms or because this is hard, hard to do properly and hard to do well. And we just feel like uh, um, it, it enables us to do things that previously weren't possible at all and we have to keep going until we capture those. And we just feel, I don't know, I just feel really privileged that everything that led up to it gives me that opportunity to be near this and be with a team of people like this when it's happening that we're able to, um, like I, I'm just really lucky because I don't have to code it. I can sit back as a, as, a, as a cheerleader for these young people tackling incredibly difficult things and knowing that it's going to bring so much pleasure to people that that feeling of creating music and sharing it and is, is such a elitist thing still. Like not everybody can do it and do it well and having that, letting other people do that is going to bring so much pleasure to people and, you know, people look from outside and think that music's just music and the music's everywhere, you know. It's a full, it's, it is culture to me. It's in movies, it's in everywhere I turn I hear music and it does something to people that nothing else does and mm. to be able to work in tech around that is a, a really privileged, I'm happy to do it for the rest of my life and feel lucky I fell into it and, um, and I just feel so lucky that I've, the team is so like these young guys are so committed and fell in love with the problem as well. And um, you know, we'll see how it plays out from here. But it's been a really fun thing to work on for the last two years. And we just, I just know it like the same thing that happened with Hunter. No matter how this plays out, whether we get product fit or not, they're the best technical team in the music industry today. I, I haven't met everybody, but if there's another team better than these guys anywhere in the world, I would be really surprised just because of the circumstances which it happened and. They shouldn't be working in music. It's only because they know me and we're on the other side of the world that they can't immediately go to Google and work on something like cars or medicine or that I have my pick of really talented engineers here and they're fascinated by the problem. And so, yeah, I feel really lucky. The second, um, one of the things we learned in that first year was it's not just music that's going to be impacted by this. What, what we're actually doing is imitating human creative skills playing the piano, playing the bass. These are things that humans can do well and AI can, if you give it enough information of how to do this, it can learn to emulate that creative skill and it's going to do that in every creative field. So that for me then the way that we create and consume entertainment in the next five years is about to be completely changed. So that was when we went from we have to we, – we, we felt like we got a very early look on what that looks like and we need to invest in this as in – we're going to – so Replica was around, all right, what other – we have a list on our, in our lab here of all the human creative skills and how would we emulate those and which are the most valuable ones or which ones are the, the most ubiquitous. And one of the ones that stand out was voice acting, that speaking isn't acting. Acting is much more than just speaking. And to be able to emulate that skill and put actors in the hands of – filmmakers, independent filmmakers, game developers, advertisers, all of that stuff, having been able to have a continuous space of all the possible voices and expressions of happiness and joy and sadness and be able to have that under text control is a weapon that in entertainment and will change how we make every type of entertainment. And so with Replica, they were the second team who came in and Google released WaveNet, which was the, the, the gun going off on that space. And we thought, well, Google's clearly and Amazon are going to work really hard on voice stuff like Siri type things and their home devices and all that. But will they have children crying and laughing? And will they have a donkey whoring? And will they, like, how far will they take the expressiveness of this? We thought someone's going to take that to the extreme and actually take it in out of just speaking into acting and being able to be in character and, and you would be able to have a pirate talk like a pirate and a, a knight speaking in his particular accents and being able to – and just exploring the possibilities of that. So we started Replica at the start of 2018. They worked on voice tech all year and then they, they're at tech stars now and they are cloning celebrity voices. They're doing characters for games. They're playing with those a lot of those ideas. But essentially the tech is very similar to what we do internally. So while our teams have their own code bases, they're their own companies, I'm an investor in them, they share very much a cultural background of openness about how do we solve these things. 
they have their own IP, they don't share code, they're all they're actually a bit competitive with each other. Um, but they do they do benefit from having a shared experience in a lab where they can sit down with other people. There's 35 people in here, they're able to sit down with each other and talk about problems. And we purposely have them very parallel to each other. So there is a shared experience. One's not just doing AI in, in cars and the other one's doing music. One's doing music and the other one's doing voice. And uh, Super Res had been doing with a third company who came along. And it was just really out of a process we did on one of the projects Popcom was doing. We realised that um, we'd seen a paper where someone was doing super resolution imagery and we just loved the idea. The class of networks we work on, uh, these, these class of networks called generative networks, where we, we basically consume a whole lot of content and we create this distribution of all the possible variants of this and then you can generate by poking different parts of this multidimensional space, this generates something that, that's new out of this. And these guys had taken, uh, they could take a, like a black and white photo and then blow it up into high res and make it colour. And we're like, how the hell does that work? And the way that they had done it is they uh, they took high res color photos and degraded them to little black and white ones and learned how to go backwards and forwards. And so, when given a bad one, we create a super res one. And we were really interested in the idea of doing that in audio, so that two reasons: how bad could we make Skype sound better, and how that's a really interesting way to compress stuff. So I don't have to send a high res thing; I can send a really crappy version and have a neural network imagine what that must have been and have a really high quality thing. So they've been working in that class of networks around taking content, audio first, but they've also worked in imagery and bringing it, bring it back to life. Or, But the class of networks is around how do we take media and imagine what it must be in another form? So that works from take an old black and white movie and make it seem like it was high res colour in HD, but then into the future, taking content made today and making it VR ready by splitting it into what the eyes must be. And using AI networks to imagine stuff is really cool, and we really love that idea because all teams are effectively doing that, replicas imagining what a pirate sounds like. You know, uh, once it's seen enough pirates, it's never seen a pirate say, hello, my name's Stephen, but it could imagine what the pirate, how a pirate would say that. Yeah. And it's just like a, a class of these networks. And we're, we, our new teams are working in text, um, we're working in imagery. We think it's going – this class of networks and this idea that AIs can imagine new things and um, is going to change how we make movies and how we make videos and content and music. And the real challenge has been for all these teams uh, and the challenge that Popgun's been working on is it's not enough to be able to generate those stuff. You have to build an interface and a control that turns that into a tool that some people can use. Because that's the whole point of this. No one wants to press a button and now comes a song. They want to have access to that so that intelligence to make what they want. So I, mean, I guess how do, you control, how do you control these networks is a big challenge. Yeah, and I guess if if we have like a thread of all your projects, we're like hunted is a back end uh, data scraping, a ranking, charting. Uh, that's ninety nine percent of the workload. And then obviously you have to make design decisions and the lateral scroll and the vignettes and stuff. But without that UX, um, uh, probably the website would have not taken um, uh, as much space. But if you're an A&R, the record company, or whoever at MTV was contacting you from New York, they loved the experience and the music uh, and actually how it works behind. It doesn't matter as long as it just works. That's, that's kind of like the Apple quote, like as long as it works, uh, most people will not try to dig under. If tomorrow you can have a, a cool-looking front end and somebody playing around with Pop Gun and making a pop tune, knowing and exactly understanding how the network works, how the uh, you get you know data in and how it creates something creative out, like the, this entire process doesn't really mean anything to a normal person. When the, so when when a kid plays FIFA on PlayStation. They don't really understand that the ball is being calculated and the player's movement and so forth. They're just playing a game. And that's the magic thing about it just works. It's kind of the magic about product market fit. It's not about trying to think about cohorts and stuff. It's one day you just you just know. Um, and yeah, putting a very, very hard tech, because uh, what you're doing is not features. There are like hard tech innovations. 
uh, and putting that in the hand of a normal person that is non, uh, like a non-technician and them succeeding, uh, that's the ultimate test, I guess, for you guys. Um, replica yeah, could right. be replica could be used by every YouTube channel, anybody that does content that wants to translate, anybody who making animation and wants to put a, a, like a, a character. You choose a potato head, what voice am I going to give him? You choose a pirate, what voice am I going to put him? I have this like fairy tale, and I need characters and animals to speak. What is the voice of a speaking pig? Like uh, p people at, at Pixar's are doing castings with voices. They're doing weeks long session to find the normal voice of you mentioned the donkey or the pig or whatever animal mm. um, that process could be potentially internalized with, I don't know, somebody who is at a school doing graphics design and a 3D animation makes his first 3D movies for 20 seconds. And in that 20 second, the bird speaks to the pig at one point. What voice do you put in? Uh, it's amazing to imagine that somebody could actually do all of that using his laptop, just like um, a musician 30 years ago needed a studio, and today they basically just need a laptop. Um, pushing that yes, into voice right. creation, that's, that's just amazing. Um, yes, that's it, right. Without characters, so we, we just totally... translations. Translation alone is is a huge problem. Uh, if the uh, ability mm. to translate in 50 languages on the fly would just be... That, uh, that alone is, is insane. Yes, that's right. It's uh, And the tech is... It'll be commonplace in the next couple of years. Like Photoshop, Photoshop for voice, being able to treat voice just like an image so that you can edit it, change it, move it around, have it say other stuff, have it speak other languages, completely change the, the voice identity, change the male to female, whatever. This is all going to be possible. And, um, you know, the, and the race is on to build out those. It, the tech isn't there yet. There's lots of examples. There's, you know, there's 10 companies or more in that space. It's still quite difficult to do. There's still a bunch of problems around emotion and capturing that, and there's tech. We so, but the nice thing for creative people is these tools are coming in the next year or so, right? And we really love this idea that um, all of this is all just playing on this broader trend of democratization of creativity and making um, this transition from mass consumption to mass creation. That these kids who grew up in Minecraft are coming through and are now entertaining themselves on. Fortnite and Roblox and they're doing it by making things. They entertain themselves by being creative. And, um, you know, we, I used to joke with my wife that there's, with watching the obsession with Minecraft, that architecture 10 years from now has got to be explosion of, 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 <laughs> of designs. And, but it's just flowed through to how they express themselves. And to me, AI is just going to bring a whole suite of new creative tools to let those same kids make whatever they can imagine. And it really just reduces the – I think we're going to find – we talk about it a lot internally at Popgun. We're going to enter an age where um, – and once we talk to music labels about this stuff, they're kind of cool with it. Initially, kind of people are threatened, and oh, we understand that. It's, it's new technology and um, because it's going to really lower the technical bar required for you to make stuff that sounds good. But what it exposes of, of who is a star and what is a star and what is talent, and it's much more than the ability to play an instrument. People are attracted to people because they're beautiful or they're funny or they're engaging, or, and this will be, you don't, you, you know, in music there is no under 15 billboard chart. You have to, as kids, you've got to compete against the adults technically, and that's really difficult. If we remove that barrier, I reckon there's young pop stars out there who, other young people are going to really identify with. And this AI is going to allow them to be discovered earlier, to communicate exactly what they're feeling and saying to each other. And it'll, I think it'll just usher in a, a completely new pop industry. And for the labels, it's all around they're going to, these people need, still need to be, have exposure and careers managed. And, you know, I see labels as VCs for the music industry and they'll still have to invest in the talent. And I think they'll just see more of it earlier than they've seen before, and I think it's um, it's it's, it's uh, going to be a great boon for them. They're going to find all these really young stars out there. Probably um, the way the way you say it, not only is it going to be maybe earlier people, people also building arts with you know help from AI on collaboration with it, or you wouldn't even know because the AI is going to be in the in the DAW, like in the Pro Tools, maybe yeah. as a VST. And so when they send you a song, yeah. it's just a song and who knows how the song was made. But I think it goes further yeah. than that. And, and Replica and, and Pop Gun are, are, are signs of that. Uh, kids now are making uh, videos, uh, animation videos easier 
than before. Uh, kids who are YouTube people now are making music. Uh, the bridge between what is an artist and is it a musician? Is it an actor? Is it a, making a video? Is it a graphic designer? Uh, kids today can make their own music videos. Maybe not and shoot like a Dave LaChapelle video, but they can make a video. They can make an artwork. Um, they can collaborate with people, you know, completely in the other side of the world. Um, like you and you're in Australia. I'm in Paris right now. And like, um, mm. and like those things we don't really think about anymore. Uh, my, yeah, the bed I think is in five years, the definition of it, what is a musician and the idea that you grew up in your room playing an instrument for nine years before you can kind of show the world what you're, what you know, how good technical you are. Um, yeah, those days are maybe not a hundred percent over. You'll still have guitar heroes in 20 years. Um, and like people playing like shred and, and, and stuff, but that's going to go away and artists are going to be, um, combining different arts into one creation. You see that with. Um, uh, companies who are doing YouTube monetization for video gamers and uh, like, I don't know, like, you know, makeup, teenage kind of YouTube channels. And those people are starting to make music. And so actually their managers is the YouTube monetization company that ends up managing the singer. And so usually they end up partnering today with a music company because that's not at all what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to monetize YouTube content and they end up with a hit song. Uh, I think Republic actually just released the first single of this mega YouTube person who is not a musician, nor was he a singer until like a month ago. And all of a sudden he has this amazing promotional platform because of the fans he has on, on, on his other thing. And he's probably like a 17 year old kid. Um, yeah, the, 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 it's going to go exponentially fast. Um, it's been an hour and a half and, um, I'm like, I, it, I took way too much of your time. So I wanted to wrap up with three kind of standard questions. We're going to ask everybody. Um, one, and I cannot imagine how, um, how like that meeting would go between you right now and the 19 year old self, uh, at 19, you came out of college. Uh, you, you were still in college. You were going to work in this, uh, consulting kind of, com kind of company working with you know, 25 different tech project hunted was not even something you were thinking about. Uh, the news website was maybe something you would start to think about soon. What would you tell the 19 year old Steven Phillips? Um, um, I, I don't know. Like I had a very weird twenties. Like I did have lots of different jobs and I never stayed anywhere longer than two years ever. I would save up enough money and then I would do whatever I wanted for a year. I painted for a year. I played, made music for a year. I'd go back when I was broke and work again. Um, I felt like, uh, I needed a, I don't know. I just felt like I'd never had. I should have been looking for a mentor or someone I respected who could help me find a path. I'd probably tell myself to start a company. I don't know why it took me till I was 35 to do that. It just didn't seem like, like I didn't grow up in the Valley. It wasn't a thing that people did in Australia was start tech companies. Like it was a, I never really heard about it until I was in my mid twenties. And by then I just didn't know how to do that. So my advice would be, to start a company probably it's my advice i give the young guys now especially these guys who are who are so talented that they've got these unis trying to make them do phds which i think is crazy that you know go and start a company with this is the perfect time you've got no family you've got no commitments you can you can always go back and get a boring job so it'd probably be 19 year old would be to yeah go and start a company don't wait 20 years to start a company yeah, Bob Moss from Techstars, I think he was explaining uh, their thesis is that talent is completely evenly distributed. There's talented people in Menboard, in Sydney, in Canberra, in Paris, in Berlin, wherever, but opportunity is not. And because opportunity yeah. hasn't, then I, I think the, the trust that us as maybe a non-California people or not New York people, we don't really believe we're, we're like, like, am I really going to start a company? Am I going to like do a music thing? Am I going to go to New York and like be acquired by Twitter or, or actually keep the company for a while? Um, and so, yeah, while talent is completely evenly distributed opportunity, but also self-belief because it's in the, it's in the genes of the Californians to believe that they're going to change the world. It's not in the genes of the Australians and definitely not in the genes of French. Um, so yeah, start a company, believe in the projects. And if you have an idea, just kind of go and do it and test it. And um, that they're, and that they're not, and the big learning for me was when I arrived in the States was they're just dudes. They're not any better than we are. They've just had a completely different expectation of what is possible. And, and that's what I spend a lot of time talking to the young guys here. 
I know that they seem like superhuman people because they produce so much cool shit out of there, but they're just dudes and we can beat them. We can compete with them. They're not any smarter than we are. They're just more of them. There's more money. There's more backing. There's more confidence. There's the things we don't have. But we'll give you the money and we'll develop the confidence. And I, I have to send – one of the first things I do when I recruit you is I send them there. And they come back going, they're just dudes. Yeah, I told you that. <laughs> like, yeah. And you guys, don't even have the, can, you guys you don't even have the language barrier. So it's really literally you can send somebody over there and they can realize that it's the same. It's just people over there the think same. more. Yeah, they think more. Uh, they, they believe That's right. more. I think in, in, in America, right. kids, they get you know, a lot of presentations in class. Um, and I, so you're used to speaking about with a lot of people, defending your project, pitching almost. It's not a pitch. Yeah, it's not yeah, like a startup yeah. pitch, but it's almost there. Um, in, um, in, in, in France, they teach you a lot about like self-criticism and, you know, how to look at the thesis, the anti-thesis. You have to contradict with yourself all the time. And so it makes you not maybe have a like I believe and I go. It's more like I believe, but also I doubt. And also then I will like try to believe something different and then doubt. And, and we love that kind of debate. Um, Uh, cool. Is there a specific um, a book or podcast that we should link to that you love and either a book you've been reading over or, or I used to, uh, no, I'm embarrassed to say I haven't had the, I haven't been able to read. I used to read ferociously in my twenties and uh, now I consume um, as much kind of music and media as I can. I uh, don't really feel like I have the time to read now. I feel like the My responsibility is to my teams and my staff and I spend every moment that I'm not spending with my family working for them. So I don't really have I, – I feel like I'll retire in 15, 20 years and I'll read every book that I missed out on reading. That you missed out on. Um, cool. Um, what are you going to do right after this interview? I'm guessing it's – Jesus, it's now 8.40. Probably have dinner. And... Yes. Yes, so I'm going to go home, see my family, and I've got an early flight to Sydney in the morning. So I'll often see music people in Sydney. So cool. cool. Um, yeah, Thank I you. Mean, yeah, no, it was it was amazing. Um, I actually want to listen to it right now. Thank you so much for your time uh, at such a late Good luck. Uh, hour. Good luck with the show, man. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> we'll speak soon. Thanks a lot, man. All right. Take thanks, care. Thanks,